Welcome to the Braybon Metabyte Junior training video. This video will discuss clinical waveform interpretation and report interpretations for the Metabyte Junior software. If you work at a sleep laboratory, this video already probably covers most of what you know. However, if you work in a dental practice, this video will help you to better understand some of the clinical data captured by the Metabyte Junior and how to better understand the clinical data. First, let's orient ourselves to the screen and take a look at what normal data should look like. There are six channels recorded on the Metabyte Junior. The first is a snore channel derived from the oral nasal cannula. The second waveform shown on the screen is the flow or airflow channel, also derived from the oral nasal cannula. The third signal is the chest effort signal recorded from the respiratory and plethysmography belt which is used to hold the metabyte on the body. The next two signals, SpO2 and pulse rate, are both collected from the finger probe sensor. The body position signal is collected from the internal accelerometer on the metabyte junior. Now let's start at the top of the screen. Here we see the snore channel. There's not very much snoring going on. The snoring in this instance is reflected as high frequency vibrations collected from the oral nasal cannula. Braybon uses a patented oral nasal cannula which is not used by other companies. This is because people breathe through both their nose and their mouth during the night and it's important to use an oral nasal cannula to capture this important information. The flow or airflow channel on a normal individual should be either sinusoidal or quasi sinusoidal in nature. It should have very little change in both amplitude and periodicity. Likewise, the chest effort signal should be either sinusoidal or quasi sinusoidal in appearance. It should be synchronized with the flow signal above it. The SpO2 and pulse rate channels in normal breathing during sleep should be relatively flat. In this instance, we see very little change on the SpO2 signal between 96 and 97%. A 3% or 4% drop in their arterial oxygen saturation would be clinically significant. But what we see here on this screen is a relatively steady state between 96 and 97%. Likewise, with the pulse rate channel, we see very little change between 43 and 46 beats per minute. And of course, the person remains in one position during this display, and they're on their left side. The histogram shown below indicates the entire recording during the night. This black band indicates where we are currently in the recording, which is 3.38 in the morning. If I select a wider display width, for example, 300 seconds, this black band becomes wider or thicker. For respiratory information, we typically look between 90 seconds and 360 seconds in display width. If you look at a display width which is too short in time, for example, 10 seconds or 5 seconds, the data is rather meaningless. Because respiratory effort activity is a slow frequency, we typically would use a display width of 90 seconds or longer, up to 6 minutes. On the histogram, we show the total night for the SpO2, pulse rate, body position, respiratory events, obstructive apnea, central apnea, mixed apnea, hypopneas and desaturations, and snoring events. Here we see SpO2 dropouts. These are automatically marked as bad data by the software. These typically occur when the patient's moving around or if they get up to go to the washroom. Here in this instance, the patient got up and we know that because it indicates standing. The body position is useful for indicating clinically important data such as positional apnea, which will be discussed later in the video. In cases where you have frequent sleep disordered breathing, you'll see many tick marks, each tick mark indicating a respiratory event. These tick marks here, for example, indicate snoring events. First, let's discuss apnea. There are three types of apneas, obstructive, central, and mixed. An obstructive apnea is defined as a cessation or stoppage of breathing of at least 10 seconds during the night. This means the person stops breathing for 10 seconds or longer, and that is why it is absolutely essential that a device that records airflow is used to define and record sleep apnea. Braybon uses an oral nasal cannula, which records both nasal breathing and mouth breathing during the night. If you use a nasal nasal cannula only, you will miss a lot of clinically significant information. So all apneas are defined as a cessation of airflow of at least 10 seconds or longer. What's the difference between obstructive, central, and mixed? Well, the difference between those three comes down to the respiratory effort channel. And that is why it is absolutely essential that you use a device that defines and records apnea using respiratory effort on the trunk of the body. That's because our lungs are located in our chest and we breathe through our chest. So an obstructive apnea 
apnea is defined as a cessation of airflow of 10 seconds or longer while there is continued respiratory effort as shown here by the continued sinusoidal waveforms on the screen. These sinusoidal waveforms indicate continued respiratory effort. Think of a vacuum cleaner. If you put your hand over the intake nozzle on a vacuum cleaner, you'll have a cessation of air passing through it, which is what you see here on this obstructive apnea event indicated by this highlighted area. This flat line indicates no airflow. Beneath it, on the chest channel, you see continued respiratory effort in much the same way as you hear the motor straining on the vacuum cleaner. You block the intake, no air goes through, but at the same time, the motor starts to strain. In a central apneic event, you have a cessation of airflow, while at the same time, you have a cessation of effort. To use the vacuum cleaner analogy again, this would be analogous to pulling the power cord out from the wall on the vacuum cleaner. In other words, you have a central respiratory mechanism shutdown, which means no ventilatory effort shown, while at the same time, a cessation of airflow. The central respiratory mechanism in the brainstem has shut down and is no longer sending signals to the body to breathe. This is why it's absolutely essential that you record both chest effort and airflow using an oral nasal cannula. If you're using a device that does not record at least these two parameters, you're missing a lot of clinically significant information. Now let's take a look at a mixed apneic event. In a mixed apneic event, you still have the cessation of airflow, of course. However, the beginning of the event has a corresponding cessation of effort followed by a resumption of effort. Here we see that there's a cessation of effort and in the second part of the event we see a resumption of effort. This defines a mixed apnea. It is simply a combination of both an obstructive and central event. Mixed apneas are typically treated the same way an obstructive apnea would be treated. Now having discussed the three types of apneas, let's go back to an obstructive apnea and look a little more closely at the particular event. We know this is an obstructive apnea event because it's labeled as OA. If I do a mouse over on the event, the software tells me it's 51.63 seconds in duration. I don't know about you, but I have difficulty holding my breath for almost a minute while I'm awake, let alone when I'm asleep. But it's amazing how often people will stop breathing during the night for one or two minutes. At the same time, as mentioned earlier, we see the continued respiratory or ventilatory effort, and this defines a textbook obstructive sleep apnea. Both prior and following the apneic event, we see recovery breathing and, of course, an arterial oxygen desaturation from 98% to 81%, or in other words, a desaturation of 17%. This desaturation event lasts 52.4 seconds. Desaturations typically lag a respiratory event by 15 to 20 seconds when using a finger probe. Also of particular interest, you'll notice that there's snoring both preceding and following the respiratory event. But interestingly, during the actual obstructive apnea event, there is no snoring. That's because there's no airflow. This further confirms a total cessation of airflow during this obstructive apnea event. Also of interest, you'll notice there's quite a bit of variability in the pulse rate channel, going from 104 to 83. Brady tachycardia is often seen in extreme cases of obstructive apnea. So to summarize an obstructive apnea event, we have a cessation of airflow of at least 10 seconds or longer. We have continued ventilatory effort. We have an arterial oxygen desaturation of 3 or 4% or more. We have confirmation of cessation of airflow as indicated as no snoring on the screen. And we also have quite a bit of variability shown.